Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, um, Lotte, for inviting me um, to this really, really wonderful um, seminar in which I learned a lot, um, and I really enjoyed that. All the, um, the lectures so far. Um, I also have the pleasure now to build on a solid ground because all the I feel all the lecturers before me already made the ground on which I can make my talk now. Um, I would like to talk about the women at the Bauhaus today, and um, we heard a lot about them already. Um, Bauhaus was a revolutionary art and architecture school and school of applied arts, um, and it was founded as a reformist school. The school wanted to reform the education of art and architecture of the um, Austrian, Hungarian, and German Empire. And as such, it was um, reformist in the way um, teaching happened there. We saw some of the focus um, activities, um, the curriculum, was very reformist by um, putting together the education in form and in crafts. And it was also reformist in terms of um, the people who worked and studied there, because um, as we saw already, um, there were a lot of women working there. It was people from both genders. But if we look conventionally at um, the history of um, Bauhaus, it's very much a history of the male heroes. And the website that Lotte just um, mentioned before, if you go for 100 years of Bauhaus, makes a great exception there. I think that it really tries to promote the many women that have been there today, uh, have been there. And also the um, lecturers today were really good in this respect. But here you see there are all these men and you would um, ask yourself then where are the women? <laughs> and my claim is that they've been there. They've been there in many different roles. They've been there as masters. They've been there as students. They've been there as lovers and as wives. And as such, they had a very strong influence on the production, on the artistic production, and the, they um, created just as much as um, their ma male colleagues the legacy of that school. Um, what I would like to um, talk to you about today is to talk about um, the policy of women on an institutional level. Um, and in a second part of my lecture, I would like to give you um, examples of some of the women who have been at the Bauhaus and shed uh, light on how their gender, so to say, influenced um, their work at the Bauhaus and beyond. But um, let's quickly go back to the origin 1919. Um, until the 19th century, you can say um, pretty much all over Europe, women were normally not admitted to art academies. Um, they had to take private lessons and usually had to pay a lot more money than their male colleagues would do. And that already meant that only a certain class of women could afford an artistic education. Weimar um, made a good exception to that at the Arts Academy there. Already from the early 1910s on, um, women were admitted. And we heard about uh, Marianne Brandt. She was one of them. I will talk about her later. But what was very influential at that time um, was that Germany with the Weimarer Republic right after the um, First World War had its first democratic um, government. And um, as a consequence of that, with that constitution from 1918, um, women had the rights to vote 
and um, they also had the right to go into to receive a university education. So that was a very new thing. And um, the Bauhaus, in a way, was um, progressive about that, that they um, also opened their doors for women. Even though, um, if you look at the conceptual model that Walter Gropius used for this school, here we've been um, talking about that first, this idea of the middle age Bauhütte and the craftspeople, that is a very patriarchal um, model. So that was, in a way, a bit of a contradiction. And there will be more contradictions, if we, as we will see. But I want to start with um, his <laughs> quoting him, um, his first address to the students in 1919. He says, we shall make no dis distinction um, between the beautiful and the strong sex. <laughs> there shall be absolute um, equal rights, but also um, complete par parity of obligations. Um, so that shows something quite interesting already. He says, on the one hand, um, everyone should be equal, but at the same time, we shouldn't give um, privileges to women, because um, until then, it was a kind of a lot of the arts education was for um, ladies of upper classes, and they received a lot of um, a lot of privileges in this respect. And this is also how Cropius saw women women artists at that time, even though already. Um, in the second half of the 19th century, there were um, serious women artists, but he didn't conceive of those. He conceived of these upper class um, ladies that would be doing knitting or house decoration or, or what have you. Um, but um, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but at least in the first year with the first um, generation of students there, there that he admitted to the school, there were actually more women than men. There were 180 um, women and 150, um, no, I'm sorry, um, that's wrong, but um, there were more women than men who were admitted. But then he goes on in this quote, and then he says, no consideration for ladies at work, all craftsmen. I shall strongly oppose the limited occupation with pretty little salon pictures to pass time. This is what I <laughs> was just saying. Um, and the question then is, how do you bridge this idea of he how he sees the the female artist so to say as that um, lady who makes makes these pretty objects and on the other hand they should become artisans they should be um, men at women at work with tools and in a very male dominated um, environment how does he bridge that and um, before i go into that i want to quickly um, introduce you to the kind of time, um, the kind of spirit of the time, which I think still um, describes it very well. Because yes, by constitution, men and women were the same in uh, um, 1919. But that was not the effect. That was not a reality um, at that point. And I think there's a, a quote by um, John Ruskin um, from about 50 years earlier that still at that point describes very well how people looked at men and women. Ruskin says, the man's power is active, progressive, defensive. He is eminently the doer, the creator, the discoverer, the defender. His intellect is for speculation and invention, his energy for adventure, for war, and for conquest. Wherever war is just, wherever conquest is necessary. But the woman's power is for rule, not for battle. 
and her intellect is not for invention or creation, but for sweet ordering, arrangement, and decision. By her office and place, she is protected from all the danger and temptation. The man in his rough work in open world must encounter all peril and trial. He guards the woman from all this with, within his house as ruled by her, unless she herself has sought it, need enter no danger, no temptation, no cause of error or offense. This is the true nature of home. It is the place of peace, the shelter, not only from all injury, but from all terror, doubt and division. So what you see here, basically, he divides between this public and the private fear, uh, sphere. And in the public sphere, it's the male who goes out to, um, to make the living, who engages in battles and all that. And at home, it's the woman who creates the peaceful universe where the man can come and um, retreat. And I want to put that up once again here in red. He says, her intellect is not for invention or creation, but for sweet order, order, ordering. So it's this distinction between the man as the productive creator and the woman as the female who is the nurturer of the emotions and who's also where the, her nature and being is for reproduction. So that was really the idea of the role of men and women at that time. And here comes Scropius and says, women have to do just the same as men. And that was not so easy because at that point they had different clothes, for example, that would prevent them from getting up at letters or do all kinds of things their male colleagues could do. And so here I just give you uh, 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 an image of a female um, builder who makes reparations at the um, Berlin Town Hall. And you can see um, it must have been quite inconvenient to her. <laughs> but not only that, a lot of um, women at that time had to kind of promote themselves. They had to act, they had to dress, and they had to be like men. And even at the Bauhaus then, among the women, there was a lot of discussion about these different roles. It was not a given that by the law, all of a sudden, there was equality. So um, if you look at the early years, um, the students, they had um, a student magazine that was called Austausch Exchange. And there was a big discussion going on about how the role of the women should be in the, in the Bauhaus. And here again, I quote one of the students. She says, it's ringing in me. I'm allowed to work, especially as a woman, I treasure my chance. Why are we women here? She's asking herself. We are like all professional women to men at least, objects of pity. Why don't you follow up your natural calling? That is the most penetrating question which they ask. But then there are others like, for example, Margarete um, Oberndorfer, who says, whoever of my female colleagues feels the power of creativity of independent artistic work in herself need not feel superfluous at the Bauhaus or feel herself pitiful, suffering cre creature who should have no other fate than that of a cow. So basically she says, yes, we can. And Bauhaus gives us the opportunity um, that we should grasp and um, go ahead. And um, last, Resi Jäger Pfleger, she says, if we master all our energies and work seriously, we want to be more than merely tolerated. We women can study just as diligently as the men, but how far can we go in art with our feminine feelings depends on each individual. 
So you can see already the way women are, per, um, are perceived and the way they perceive themselves in these years um, is already, it's not clear. There are many different um, directions, you could say. And then if we go to the masters, um, for example, my favorite one, Johannes Itten, Meister Itten, um, there is a whole different reality. He says right after one year after the Bauhaus opened, he says the numerical proportion of male and female students is such that without question, the admission of ladies must be restricted. <laughs> The pottery, wood sculpture, etc. workshops are particularly overfloating with women. <laughs> I therefore propose that for the foreseeable future, only women of very exceptional talent be accepted. <laughs> so um, what you see here already, there's a problem that they have not enough spots at these workshops. And then, of course, um, the blame is on the women, they are too many and they should um, go out and only very exceptional. So he doesn't claim that we should put the, the scale up higher for all the applicants. No, it should come up a little bit higher for the women only. Now, um, Schlemmer kind of um, puts more oil into the foyer and he, fire and he says, in any case, the issue of girls and women at the Bauhaus constitutes one of the key problems within the school. I mean the question of equality, toleration, or exclusion. So he calls women to be a serious problem. But what the serious problem is at that time that they started this art school and after more than two years into um, the practice, they still really don't have um, any, any um, serious products to show. And it's both um, the politicians and also the, the how should I say, the professional, um, the professional circles, they say, well, show us what is happening there. What are you doing there? So they have, uh, uh, the masters have a good pressure to deliver something to show what comes out of it. And of course, apart from that, there's always not enough money at that school. So the school in itself um, has a crisis that needs to be faced. Then Kropius, only two years after the Bauhaus was open, says, in our experience, only in very rare cases can women perform the very hard work of stone, sculpture, carpentry, wall painting, wood sculpture, art printing. One should be careful to avoid any more unnecessary experiments in this direction. And that's very interesting because he says that, but at the same time, he of course does not um, change it on the on the how he promotes the school. These are all I'm quoting now from um, protocols and um, from letters within the masters. He does not say officially we're gonna put the number of um, female applicants down. He does not do that. The program remains the same, but the policy um, actually changes. And in a letter to Annie Weil, who writes him that she wants to become a student at the Bauhaus, he goes even further and he says, it is not advisable in our experience that women work in the heavy coal craft areas such as carpentry and so forth. For this reason, a woman's section has been formed at the Bauhaus, which works particularly with textiles, bookbinding and pottery. Um, also accept women. We are fundamentally opposed to the edu education of women as architects. <laughs> now that's the last sentence is a little bit tricky because you could say that he on the one hand um, did not want to have women um, have an education at ar in architecture, 
But at the same time, this was in 1920 and they did not manage yet to build up an educational department in architecture. So he might have also used that excuse in order not to admit that they couldn't build up an architectural department yet. But in any case, what is clear, what he already um, implies in this um, letter is that from 1920 on, they segregate women and men by establishing what um, they called a women's class. And what you see here um, is that it's um, some of the students there, they, do, they seem to have fun in that women's class also. But it's not that this women's class, people who are in that class after the focus, that they would have the same rights to the education as their male colleagues, because what that women class um, very, very fast turns into is the weaving workshop. And here again, um, Oskar Schlemmer, he has this um, wonderful quote where he says, where there is wool, you women find weaving just to pass the time. So this is why in the beginning I gave you this quote by um, John Ruskin about the policy of the two spheres because you really see it's absolutely in the heads of um, these masters again that they say, okay, um, if there's wool, then it's up, it's women's business, so to say, and this is where they should go. So here, a picture of the weaving workshop um, in Weimar. Um, it's also interesting, um, not only in terms of that they say women should choose that because textile is female, but it was also regarded as um, as lower hierarchy um, within the hierarchy of art, craft, and applied art. Um, textile didn't have um, the same value, so to say, as metalworks or woodworks. So that was something men couldn't promote themselves um, properly. So let's leave that to the women. But then, as we already heard, women made wonderful things in this textile workshop. And here you just see some of the examples here, for example, um, by Gunther Stölzl. Um, and it's not that they just intuitively created um, some kind of decorati decorative pieces, but they really took a very scientific and intellectual approach to weaving. Here on the left-hand side, you see um, color studies by Stölzl and Otte, and they actually went out to investigate how in the weaving industry, how um, weaving is made there, and all these experiences they um, collected in, in, their, um, in their notations, and these um, introduced their, or informed their create creations, of course. So, um, in 1923, um, there is the first Bauhaus exhibition. And as we all know, um, they were really the masters, especially Gropius was really under pressure because um, he didn't have much to show. As I said before, there was still no architecture department. Um, they, he didn't really have a lot of success stories that he could show to the world except the weaving objects of the women. So you see here that's um, one of the interiors um, of the exhibition and you see a lot of um, uh, um, products from the weaving workshop from curtains to um, wall decoration to carpets. So um, they were very successful so to say. And um, that again created a problem because it was not the idea that, they, that these women would be housed in a separate class in order to become better or to, to deliver um, better objects um, than men. 
Um, so the admission of women um, subsequently declined even more. And especially if you um, compare the very early period at the Bauhaus in Weimar to um, afterwards, then the second period in Dessau, you can see that the numbers of admitted women um, decline. And one of the reasons is also that in, uh, um, in Dessau, the whole education and the approach becomes more technical, less artistic, less, um, less expressionist, so to say. And that is again where then some of the women also didn't feel um, they didn't feel they were not, it was not so appealing to them. So that was um, one thing. And um, in the longer run, it even um, went down to 25% at the end when Mies was a director because Mies was extremely um, disciplinary in style, if not to say, um, if not to say against women, but you can really see that this, um, in this respect, it went further down instead of um, up. But if we look at the um, weaving workshop in Dessau, it got um, modernized. They had more space and they had more, um, more um, modern instruments, so to say. And that created also within the works um, a different or a turn that um, there was more cooperation with industry and the goal was really about serial um, production. Someone talked about this obsession with creating types at the Bauhaus and that also at that point then introduced the weaving workshop but with the success that um, the weaving workshop also started to make money. And I don't know whether it was so clear from what we heard before, but the whole idea about the, the Bauhaus was that the students would create objects that could be sold on the market. And so that from the return, the school could be financed. And they put that up as a very early or as a claim already in Weimar, but they always had extreme difficulties to live up to that claim. And only under Hannes Meyer in Dessau, it slowly um, started to work out. And the weaving workshop with the women was one of the, um, the departments that really brought in money. And you can see here um, that the um, objects that they produced um, then was more um, in terms of serial production. Here you see, for example, one of the um, rooms at the, um, at the new building by Dessau, one of the student rooms, and you can see that um, the, the blankets that were produced for that in series would then also be used in these rooms. So the idea was really to um, make these objects um, compatible at the market. So um, if I want to close about the institutional policy of um, towards women at the, at the um, Bauhaus, um, you could probably say, like I said in the beginning, that there was a decline from the admission of higher number of female students to much lower um, in the end in Berlin. You can also say there was a, a, a restriction while in the beginning on paper everyone had equal access to all the different um, directions of education. It kind of narrowed it down that um, most of the women were pushed into the weaving workshop but at the same time, um, here you have an um, image of some of the women um, in front of the, uh, behind, the um, behind, uh, behind the loom. And I think it's quite interesting because you see them kind of smiling um, 
and it looks like they are fenced, they are like in a prison, but at the same time, like I said before, they seem to have a lot of fun. So it was also um, among the women, um, there were different perceptions about being cornered in that weaving workshop because some of them said then we don't have to um, deal with this role thing we don't have to fight these men who always ask us these stupid questions why we are here and why we're not at home educating or producing children and things like that so that on the one hand some of them felt as a liberation while the other on the other hand Others, they really felt that they are cornered and are deprived of um, having the same possibilities in their education as their main colleagues. Now, I would like to go um, to the second part of my um, lecture. Um, how much time do I have? The second part, which is 20 minutes? Okay which is about um, the different biographies. And I um, decided to break that down into these few, four different, I call it for now, functions, but um, and show you just a glimpse of one representative um, of each. And here, if we are talking about the form Meister, I didn't have any choice. I could only um, present you one, which is um, the dance pedagogue, dance and color pedagogue and music pedagogue, um, Gertrude Gruno, because she was the one and only form master next to Kandinsky and Klee at the Weimar Bauhaus. And here, um, I'm running into a problem that is um, not only um, significant for her, but significant for women of her generation as such. And that is that there's very, very little documentation about her. Um, and this is just simply because women, they operate differently when it comes to promoting their works, when it comes to creating um, creating uh, a legacy um, than their male um, than their male um, colleagues did if you think of for example you could say Le Corbusier was one of her um, contemporaries and if you go to the Fondation in Paris you will find millions of documents you can write on, you can research about, and you could look into. And that, of course, if someone leaves behind such a vast archive, there's also a lot to interpret and publish afterwards. If someone doesn't care about what he or she leaves behind, there's a limited um, potential of then also writing legacies for um, historians to come later on. And an example of that was certainly Gertrude Gruno. <coughs> but um, she was born in Berlin, and um, this is also where she received an education as a musician, um, mainly as a singer in the beginning. But already in during her education, she um, developed an interest in what is called synesthetic pedagogic, which is a, um, a kind of teaching where all the senses, not only the voice, but all the different senses are equally triggered, so to say. So um, she then, after her education, she starts teaching she first teaches in Berlin and Jena. And this is in Jena where Meister Itten um, hears a lecture about her and um, is very, very fascinated. So he invites her for um, a lecture at we in Weimar at the Bauhaus. And subsequently, um, she starts teaching there. And her teaching was inspired by a Swiss musician called um, Jacques um, Dalcroix. And it was about a rhythmic education 
rhythmic um, music education here, you see um, some of the um, some of the um, the exercises people had to make. So what you see her then um, she creates Kruno creates what is called a, a pedagogy in harmony, and that's very interesting because it's like you could call it something how to develop your personality also. And she was convinced, just as Meister Itten, that in order um, to be creative, you have to be in harmony with yourself. We've been talking about a lot of like occultism, about um, Rudolf Steiner before, um, and this is the kind of direction that she also has, and she says, if you want to be creative, if you want to um, to design objects, if you want to make um, art, you have to be in harmony with yourself. And everyone by nature has this harmony in him or herself. But it needs certain exercises to make this harmony breaking out in yourself. So she developed um, her Harmonisierungslehre, and that was a curriculum that um, created exercises that focused on um, color, on sound, and movement, because it should um, bring all the senses together. And that, at the beginning, was very well received also by Gropius, because Gropius was in his first program, if you read, it's all about organic, hol holistic education. And it was this kind of the spiritual was very important. And she was a representative of that, so to say. And what is interesting, she not only educated the students, but she also educated the masters, Itten Klee and Feininger, for example, they went to take her courses also. And here you see um, some of the notes that students did. Um, there are these color um, circles that she developed also in cooperation with Itten. And then she, um, she developed movement according to this color. And one of the students, now I don't remember anymore who it was, I think it was Otti Berge, and she with a certain horror in the 1970s retrospectively um, recalls that in this class, all the students would have to stand up. And then Kruno says, and now we dance the color blue. And they had to make all kind of strange <laughs> movements. Um, so that so much for her pedagogy. Now, her role as a master I think was interesting in such a way that even though in the beginning she did only a little bit of lecturing, but as you um, saw in the slide I just showed, um, this Harmonisierungslehre made very soon a very essential part of the curriculum, and she basically worked there um, full time. But even though she did so, she made la much less money than her um, male colleagues, than the masters, and she never really had like the same contractual um, conditions as the main, main um, colleagues. She was always referred to in the programs as masters, just like Itten and Klee, but her um, conditions of um, how she was employed at the Bauhaus was comparably really, really bad. So what happens then, um, as I said before, from the 1920s on, there was a big pressure on the Bauhaus that they have had to show success examples. And there was also pressure in terms of money. They didn't have enough money. And moreover, politics also. They were all regarded as um, communists or Bolshevists, so there was a lot of um, pressure from the outside, and Kropius had to react one way or the other. And you probably know about the argument he had with Meister Itten, which basically led to the fact that Itten had to leave the Bauhaus because um, 
he his kind of teaching and the idea of an absolutely free art um, was not supported by um, Cropius anymore. And from the moment that Itten was gone, Gruno also kind of left her main supporter. And um, so subsequently she was criticized a lot. And one of the major criticisms she received was that this kind of um, education that focuses on personal development of the students does not leave any tangible results. There are no objects that you could take and put into photograph and put into a magazine or exhibit in an exhibition. So what is this all about? And um, they kicked her out in 1924. She then um, goes to Hamburg and um, teaches there until 1934. She also works with the um, phenomenologist Ernst Kassirer, philosopher. Um, and um, in the end, during the war, no, and for after 1934, she travels to England and Switzerland when she, where she stays for a while, but then she has to come back to Germany during the war where she dies in 1944 um, in impoverished condition. Now I would like to put light on one of the students, but I will go through that very, very um, fast because we had a wonderful um, presentation by um, Vida before. Um, and so I don't want to tell you the same things twice, but just um, the example of uh, Marianne Brandt, who um, was born in Chemnitz in a kind of upper middle class environment. She had three sisters, only three sisters, and grew up in a very liberated home with um, her father being a lawyer, but with a great interest in art and theater. And so um, she was one of these first women who went to the art school in Weimar, even um, before the Bauhaus. And I love this um, photograph because here you see her with a cigarette in, his, her, in her hand in 1923 and also one of the other um, her students. And I think that's very, um, that's very telling also for this generation of women because none of them were um, these kind of girly women. They really had to stand their man, so to say, in order to venture out and push the boundaries in these professions that are, were until then very much um, male dom dominated. Um, as I said before, I will run through that now very quickly. She discovered and was um, extremely um, fascinated um, by the Bauhaus in, through the exhibition in 1923 and um, decided to forget about all the kind of decorative um, artwork she did before and venture into the Bauhaus. And there she was in the Vorkurs um, that was then thought by um, Moholy Nosh, who was a great um, admirer and supporter also, and certainly had his share in the fact that she, after the Vorkurs, did not have to go into the weaving class like all the others, but could go straight into um, the um, metal workshop where together with one other male student called Wilhelm Wagenfeld, she produced some of the um, design classics that um, like we heard before can still be um, bought all over the world nowadays. Um, just very briefly, I like that quote again to see how she was received in this metal workshop. She writes, I was not exactly welcomed with open arms. A woman has no business in a metal workshop. Thus run the general opinion. People later confessed to me and they certainly made me feel their disdain by ordering me 
to carry out the most tedious tasks imag imaginable. God only knows how many hemispheres of brittle new silver I embossed with great gusto, thinking this was the way it ought to be, and that nothing's easy at the beginning. So you really see um, what it meant at that time to um, work in this context. And here um, we have see these images before, but also um, you can see that this is really, she, um, she managed very well to bring these ideas of the Bauhaus education, this idea of the neue Sach Sachlichkeit that creates objects from primary forms. She um, managed very well to translate that into um, objects of daily use. We know, we heard that she was then in the late 1920s head of um, the metal workshop. She um, not only um, created these household um, items, but also lamps. Um, here you see a clock. Um, and like we heard before, she was an excellent photographer and also um, made an enormous collection of these photo collages that are not only aesthetically pleasing, but are very, very interesting at documents of that time as critical documents of the life at the Bauhaus and um, the way um, that she was, the, the kind of conditions um, that she was on under. Um, unfortunately or sadly, in the end, she was mobbed, you could say, um, and she was mobbed out of the, the workshop, even by um, a guy she um, protected very much in the beginning. And the, the, the reason was that she had to go was that um, the, the, there was a turn in production of the things at the metal workshop that were, they wanted to go to bigger scale furniture and things like that, and they said, she physically is not strong enough to um, create these objects and she's just making these little decorative models for these um, design things and so um, she was she was um, kicked out we heard about um, her inner emigration in her parents home in chemnitz and that she um, died as a very poor woman, so I don't go more into that. I want to um, save time, the remaining time, for the last two categories. Now we're down to the lovers. And here we have Lotte Stambese, who was um, born in um, 1903. And she did not work in Weimar at all, but um, came to the Bauhaus in Dessau. Um, she had, like all the others, though, still um, education in weaving also because she worked at the Deutsche um, Werkstätten in Hellerau under Tesseno, where there was also a weaving workshop. And this is um, where she worked, but she was not very, she was never really very funded, fond of that. And even then, when she got um, admitted, she worked again with weaving under Josef Albers, but um, she was very much interested in technology and tried to, um, to, um, to reform the work she did through the use of technology and soon was able to join the architecture class then that, um, that was there in Dessau. The problem was that um, she had a romantic affair with the Bauhaus director, Hannes Meyer, who was then married. And that was something um, that couldn't be supported at the Bauhaus. So, so she was forced to leave the Bauhaus because of that. Even though um, the kind of relationship between her and the married Maya would go on. 
Um, she tries to get away from him, um, moves to Berlin, and then um, works again in his private office um, for a project of the Union Building in Bernau, which we um, saw already. And um, then she decides again to go away and seek for her independence and um, goes to um, Vienna and Brünn. Um, but she always keeps going back to, to Meyer and in 1930 even follows him with the Bauhaus Brigade to Moscow um, where she gets pregnant from him and gives, um, gives birth to their common son. But at that point already, um, Maya um, lives with another woman and so they never really get together, but this kind of situation really um, extremely impacts her own career as an architect. So in the beginning, she stays in the Soviet Union, where she then um, meets a former Bauhaus student, Mart Stamm, the Danish um, architect and um, chair designer. And in 1934, they both, at that point, um, already they were, they had become lovers, but they both had to emigrate or get out of the Soviet Union because of the political unrest. So um, they, while they were still in the Soviet Union, they together work on a project here, an urban development, for the city of Orsk. Um, but as I said before, that couldn't materialize because of political reasons they have to flee. So then they move to um, Amsterdam and um, they get married. Um, but the problem is that until um, 1930, no, and in 1938, they, um, they make, they open their own architecture office and do a lot of like um, projects, interiors, also photography. Um, they do build works together. Um, then they even have another child together, but Soon, Stam again has an affair with another woman and um, their relationship falls apart again. <laughs> then the problem with um, Lotte Stam Bese is that um, she still until then, even though she always worked with these architects, but she never had a diploma of her own. So she couldn't um, make her own business, so to say. So at even though she's a full grown architect already, she decides to, um, to take an education at the academy in Amsterdam and finally gets her diploma as an architect. And, um, in, and from then on, she divorces Stamm and um, creates her own office, which after the war makes a lot of um, a lot of urban and housing projects in the city of Rotterdam. Now, what is extremely fascinating about her, I think, is that in 1946, right after the war, she's um, appointed as the, at the Department of Urban Development of the Reconstruction of Rotterdam. She becomes the head of that. And this is extremely um, exceptional because Rotterdam is the only Dutch city that was during the war systematically destroyed by the Germans. And the fact that she only one year after the war can enter this department again and work with the reconstruction really speaks for her professional um, abilities and the fact that she um, then with her own office gets to plan whole neighborhoods in um, in the periphery also of Rotterdam I think um, is kind of a reward of her um, of what she could do now the last um, the last category the wives I speak of one wife here 
which is um, Lucia Moholi. Um, she was born as um, Lucia Schulz in Prague. Um, in now I for, now I didn't have the uh, never mind. Um, and she um, she came from a Jewish family, even though her family basically they never practiced religion, and it didn't occur to her until later on in Nazi Germany she encountered um, severe problems of that. But in Prague, still as a young woman, she grew up also in a very enlightened um, household. And um, she studied philosophy, philology, and art history. And then, um, as a young woman, um, goes to Germany, where she works for various different um, publishing houses and also writes under a male pseudonym um, various um, poetries and publishes it. But from a very early age on, also, she has an interest in photography. And um, she just, she, um, she practices it in her spare time. And that's one thing I forgot to mention, is that um, apart from the weaving workshop, all the women at the Bauhaus, they also engaged with photography, because at that point, that was a new medium, and there was no male history of heroes who could be challenged. So they could just, they used that and started experimenting that. And it was also a very powerful medium for them because they could create their own view of society, their own view of this new women of the earliest 20th century. They could do that with the photographs they did, um, which appeared in various publications, of course. So um, Lucia was one of them. And when she was in Berlin in uh, um, 1920, she meets the um, young Hungarian artist Laszlo moholy Nosh and um, falls in love with him and marries him. And then they go together um, to the Bauhaus, where she never had a formal position, but she had um, a very strong role in promoting the Bauhaus because of her photography. Because basically, over a series of several years, she took photographs here. You have of the um, of the buildings, she took photographs of the people, she photographed the works that were produced at the Bauhaus, and that was because she had a very um, big interest in documents, uh, documentation. And in this respect, we all know, we saw some of um, her husband's works with photography, which were more artistic, more experimental. But this was not where her interest was lying. She saw photography as a means to document the reality, to reproduce reality. And as such, she was one of the major promoters of a photography of um, the Neue Sachlichkeit. And um, in, this, um, in this way, she also, she really had an enormous role in later on um, producing the legacy of that school because her photographs would be all over. Um, and regarding her role, um, her husband, um, in the beginning, it's important to realize when they meet, she already had a profession, she already sustained herself, she was a full-grown woman, so to say, while he was a very insecure artist, and she even sustained him financially for a good share of time. And also, subsequently, then, she always supported him, and they did a lot of the photography works also together. So retrospectively, in the 1970s, he says, her intellect was like a bonfire, which would light up my emotional chaos. She taught me how to think. 
So it was really this kind of perfect fusion of an artist couple. Um, like I said, she promoted the Bauhaus like nobody else, I would say. Also the Bauhaus in its totality, you know, not only the, the, um, the architecture, but also the artworks, the people and all that. But then what happens to her is um, they get separated in 1929. Um, Moholy, as we know, goes to Chicago. She has a, a, a respective career, first in England, where she works as um, after the war um, as um, making microfilm archives for the UNESCO in Iran and Iraq and Turkey. And then um, in the late 1950s, she goes to Zurich, where she works as a freelancer and, um, and remains there until she dies. What is important, though, and that is quite um, sad and um, telling, unfortunately, for many artist couples, is that if you look at the works they did together, she and her husband during the Bauhaus time, it's usually him who gets the credits. For example, um, they um, invented this photogram together, but if you read in the, um, in the literature, he's claimed to be the inventor of this. Um, so, and there are a couple of other things, books they wrote together, which are credited to him and all these things. So in 1972, um, she makes a book of her own um, that she calls um, Marginalien zu Moholy Norsch, and it's like marginal notes where she tries to correct um, the history and also um, show her own contribution. Now I'm down um, to the last but not least um, picture here. It's one of these collages by Marianne Brandt, which I said um, I'm very much fascinated um, about. And um, I think this collage, in a way, um, pictures very well the situation between these two um, sexes at the Bauhaus. On the one hand, you can see the woman being liberated, being flying up, so to say, given these new opportunities that she has all of a sudden. But at the same time, you see that there's the man on top who basically keeps her like a marriott on the string. That's one way of interpreting it. You could also say, um, if you look at it, the guy looks pretty small, right? And it looks, it won't take very long and he won't be able to hold her anymore. Um, I would um, like to leave it with that. Um, thank you very much.